and uh, it's a good thing Keith is here. He'll uh, he'll make sure that I don't foul anything up. Me and cyberspace are not friends, but me and the Bible are. So if you have questions, either let Chris or uh, or Keith know, because I'm the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> trying to deal with computers. Okay, my understanding is that we go about 50 minute shots and uh, and then we break for questions. And if I've misunderstood, someone can uh, someone can let me know. Uh, the subject that we're going to deal with uh, is uh, for this class, I understand is spiritual warfare. Uh, I'm always learning. I've worked with this. For a number of decades but it's also something that there's always more to learn so uh, my subjective experience would be if someone thinks they're on top of this in such a way that they got it nailed i would say probably probably not there's there's just too much to be learned uh, here's what i would like to do at least in my mind the way this outlined in my head was uh, the first hour i would like to go over an overview of spiritual warfare uh, I think that uh, too often the notion is that spiritual warfare is demonic warfare. Uh, spiritual warfare includes demonic warfare, but it is certainly not the sum total of spiritual warfare. Um, so let's do an overview dealing with all three, and that's what we'll do here this first 50 minute session. Let's, let's deal with all three of the uh, opponents that the New Testament uh, identifies that we need to learn how to, remember two R words, recognize and respond to. If you can recognize a problem, but you do not know how to respond to it, uh, it's, it's not all that helpful. I can recognize when water is running uh, on the floor in my house, but, but because I can recognize it doesn't mean that I know what to do to stop the water. Uh, you can learn how to recognize attacks from the world, the flesh, and the devil. But if you have not become uh, conversant with uh, responding in such a way that you win instead of lose, it's just head knowledge. So I will attempt to make sure that you're comfortable with both recognizing and responding to attacks from the three. Learning how to recognize, learn how to respond. This may be repeat. If some of you had this uh, course a year ago, I think I taught two sessions last year. Uh, the intro, I'm going to repeat. A second lesson, digging a little deeper, uh, which I will repeat. And then two lessons that I know I didn't even didn't touch because uh, Harry asked and Lewis asked if I would uh, do four sessions on this. So I will. But at any rate, we'll start with the overview. Uh, that will be session number one. Uh, we'll start with, uh, we'll, we'll then go to opposition. Why is it that in the Christian circle outside of uh, uh, Pentecostal churches, uh, missionaries overseas, and I don't get objections from Pentecostals. I don't get objections from missionaries. They'll, they'll both say, of course, it's real. We just want to be more effective working at it. Uh, I'm getting less and less objection from people out of my camp. My camp is the one where we were essentially told, as long as you believe, belong to Jesus, as long as you read your Bible, as long as you memorize scripture, you're, you're fine. Nothing can go wrong. You don't have to be a Christian very long. and You certainly don't have to be a pastor or missionary very long to find out uh, spiritual warfare. You don't respond like a, a, a rabbit's foot where read your Bible and pray and everything goes away because you're going to find out there are a lot of very dear Christian brothers and sisters that read their Bible and pray, some of them more than you do. I've worked with people that have memorized far more scripture than I have, and yet they were still involved with, uh, with the demonic issues or they were involved in spiritual warfare. They just didn't understand it. So I'm, I'm suggesting that even within my circles, uh, in the last few years, I've spoke at Biola Talbot, uh, I've spoke at Trinity, I've spoke at Western Seminary, I've spoke at Calvin uh, College in, in uh, Michigan, um, just different places, and I'm sure there's others, I'm, I'm just blanking on it now, but places where in the past, someone, uh, Multnomah School of Bible, I've, I've been asked if I would speak there when they get a session on angelology or demonology through the missions department probably 
but uh, and I've said sure I would be willing to do that um, I, I'm just suggesting that even in places that traditionally ran from this topic they're not running there have been some people that uh, weren't running from the get-go but um, I, I guess all I'm trying to say is it is a topic that needs to be understood with more clarity uh, it's a topic that uh, there are extremes uh, there are some people who make everything a demon, a demon hiding under every bush, which is simply, you know, fabrication. But there are other people that are so adept at uh, redefining uh, demonology that nothing is demonic. Everything is logical. Everything is psychological. Uh, everything is mental. Everything is a disease, an addiction of some kind and, and uh, you know, just uh, suck it up and take responsibility for your issues and don't think about demons. It's just kind of a primitive way of, of uh, explaining things people don't understand. That's baloney. So at any rate, that you're here, that you're interested in the topic, it's great. Uh, again, if, if you end up, when we're, by the time we're done, with a working knowledge that uh, uh, you're more effective with it than you were before you took the class, then maybe it's been beneficial. Uh, if some of you know more about this than I do, then unfortunately uh, you should be the one teaching the class, I suppose. But uh, uh, at, at any rate, let's jump into it. When I'm dealing with the overview, uh, the first class we're dealing with, I know I sent you notes. I sent them to Lewis at least, and I think you got them. On the first page, you're going to see the world, the flesh, and the devil, and you will see two verses underneath uh, each each topic. Uh, usually when I'm doing this, I will ask people to uh, draw a circle and divide it like a pie into three pieces uh, on a piece of paper. And I would suggest that you make the pieces as... Uh, symmetric as you can make them equivalent in every way at least to the best of your human ability i'm trying to send a message with that you'll also see two verses underneath each of the topics the world the flesh and the devil uh, i've had people ask me there are so many more verses why don't you put more verses uh, underneath the different ones and i'll say uh, well i had a teacher in seminary way back in the 70s called it retroactive inhibition he said sometimes means overkill Sometimes the more you put, the less people remember. So uh, I purposely am giving you two verses, two verses, and two verses for at least two reasons. Number one, if I give too many, if I give you 15 verses, which we could easily do on, on probably any of these, sometimes people end up remembering nothing. They just quit. They give up. The other thing is, I asked this one of the last times I was out speaking, I asked the group, I said, if I put one verse under demonic warfare and 15 verses under battles with the flesh, what is the message that I'm communicating even if I don't say it? Well, that battles with the flesh are more important than battles with the demonic because we've got so many more verses. I don't believe battles with the world are more important than battles with the flesh nor battles with the demonic. I think all three uh, are capable of uh, ruining a day for you and distracting a Christian life. Uh, so even as we lay out the verses, I want I want symmetry. Two, two, and two. So under one piece of that pie on the circle, put the word world. On one piece, put flesh. One piece, put the devil or demonic. Uh, if that seems too simple and you're intimidated by people, then put uh, uh, physiological issues, sociological issues, and supernatural issues. Sometimes I have people say, well, that makes me sound more more educated. I go, I don't care about pretense. You'll, you'll figure that out before we're done. I care about what you can put on the table. Um, let's just go in order. When I start with the world, uh, I use 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17 and James 4, 4. Um, I'm going to paraphrase most of the time when I'm here because I don't want to lose the time. Uh, you can always check the verses to make sure I'm not making stuff up. I hope you do. But uh, John, uh, and, and the Apostle John in 1 John 2 essentially says that if you say that you love God, but you're in love with this world, uh, you're, you're, you're fooling yourself. Uh, all that is in this world, he says, is consists of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the boastful pride of life. And then in verse 17, he gives you a reminder. Remember, the things of this world are fading away. The things of God abide forever. 
So 15 says there's a problem. 16 says here's what the problem is, and here's how you know here's how you delineate or differentiate uh, between aspects of the world as opposition. And then 17 says here's some resolution. So let's let's break that down a little bit. I remember when I had someone approach me, a young man, about eight years old, and he said that John 3.16 says God loved the world, and 1 John 2 says that if you love the world, the love of God isn't in you. And so his question was, so is the world good or bad? I don't understand. And I thought, I've taught enough seminary students over the years, I've never had one of them come up with that kind of an observation. So I told the eight-year-old a pretty good observation for anybody, but particularly someone in the second or third grade or whatever grade he was in. I said uh, the word cosmos is the Greek word for world. It's used in a variety of contexts. Some of you probably use Hebrew and Greek. You'll know uh, what I'm saying. Uh, but there are three that are primary. Uh, it's used as a synonym for people. That's your John 3.16, for God so loved the world. He's talking about mankind, uh, people that he gave his only begotten son. Uh, Hindus are wrong. I'm not trying to be mean, but God did not. He's not uh, the rock. He's not the grass. And he didn't die for the grass or the rocks. Everything is not God. God is not everything. Monism, uh, pantheism. I don't believe either one of them are correct. They're certainly not biblical. Uh, God died for people. Uh, second way it's used is uh, you'd see like in Acts uh, chapter 17, 24, God made the world. In other words, he made the twinkly things the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything that lies in the created order. Uh, so it's used of the natural created order. And then it's used uh, as, a, as a way of describing a system in rebellion against God. And that's what you see in the James 4. If you, love, if you say you love God, but you're in love with this world, you're an adulterer. It's pretty strong language. So again, how's it used? Well, a synonym for people of the created order and then a system in rebellion against God. The Greeks were smart enough, uh, or the writers of the New Testament, or say the Spirit of God who inspired it, to say that we should be smart enough to look at context when we're saying, how is that word being used? So I told that young man that I referenced earlier, I said, when God is talking about uh, loving the world uh, so much he gave his only begotten son, he's using the word cosmos world as a synonym for people. In 1 John 2, when he says, if you love this world, the love of the Father is not in you, he's essentially saying you can't love God and love a system that is in active rebellion against God at the same time. They're going two different directions. So what's the world? It's a system in rebellion against God. Uh, what does it consist of? He lets you know in 16. He says all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the boastful pride of life. How do you explain that? I'm sure there's a variety of ways, but again, in a discipleship class, a Sunday school class, a college class, uh, I, I want things as simple as I can make them because I want people to remember it and I want people to use it. If you tell people later that you had a class with me and they say, what'd you learn? And you say, well, if you give me two hours and I'll go back to a stack of notes, I can tell you, you didn't learn anything. Uh, at least not anything that you're going to effectively use because when you're tied to tied to notes, you don't use it. Uh, too many opportunities come up to speak, at least for me. I'm in a game and someone's sitting next to me. Uh, I'm riding a bus and someone sits down by me or the tram out at the airport. Uh, you, you don't create opportunities like that for like that. God creates divine appointments and either you know your material or you don't. And if you say, hold it, I've got a Bible in my suitcase. Can you give me a, you know, a, a, five minutes to go find my Bible, and then can you give me 10 minutes to see if I can find any verses on what you're talking about? People won't sit around. They're not usually that polite. So I'm suggesting keep things simple and learn things well enough that you can actually put them on the table and use them. That, uh, that is far more uh, efficient and far more effective than having rows of binders that say, I've been to this class, I've been to that class, I've got a binder up on my shelf that says I've been there, but I don't have a clue what I learned. Uh, and I would need hours to be able to try and go back through it to see if I can figure out something I can use. That's not real helpful. Maybe sincere, it's not helpful. So I, again, I will try with the material I've said it earlier. I'm, I'm being redundant, said a couple of times. I, I want you to have something you can use. When I'm looking at the world, 
what 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 makes up this world system and rebellion against God? John says, well, it consists of the lust, the flesh, lust, the eye, the boastful pride of life. How do I explain those? I will say, well, contextually, we're dealing first with one piece of the pie, which represents an enemy, identified as the world. I know what it means. It's an opposition against God, systematic, systemic opposition against God. Um, solicitation from the world is always external. Write that over that piece of the pie. It's external solicitation. How does it work? When I'm talking about the lust, the flesh, I will say that it is external because that's where solicitation comes from this enemy. It's external solicitation designed to trigger a physiological response in your life. Um, you're driving down the road, it's really hot. You see a billboard that says uh, Coca-Cola, one mile Jimmy's Diner. You weren't necessarily thinking about drinking Coca-Cola and you weren't even thinking it was hot. You're just driving in your car. But when you see the billboard, all of a sudden, there's a, a physiological stimulation that says, I'm thirsty, I want something cold to drink. Uh, that a different billboard could say, uh, I don't know where you eat, uh, Outback Steakhouse. Uh, steak and shrimp, one mile. You maybe were talking to your spouse, you know, who knows what you were doing, daydreaming while you're driving. You weren't thinking about food. And now you're thinking, gosh, out back one mile. I know, I'm kind of hungry. I'll pull over. There was a, a, an urge triggered something physiological in you that says, I'm hungry. That's what we're talking about. It's external. The radio can do the same thing. Uh, I tell people I grew up on Motel, which is true. Uh, Supremes, Temptations, Top, Stevie Wonder. Uh, that was my music uh, growing up to this day. I have it uh, behind me. If you saw what I had loaded, it's not with on my machine. It wouldn't be what most Christian pastors are supposed to have. I have, <laughs> I have lots of Motown on my, uh, on my recorder that, uh, I uh, sometimes open the door because some of the secretaries here actually like it now, but uh, if they don't, I just close the door and enjoy my music. But when I'm driving, I typically don't turn my music on because I have discovered over years when my, when my music comes on that reminds me when I was a kid, I start driving faster. I have to look down at my speedometer and say, slow down. And I think it's because, you know, I hear the, the, uh, the Temptations, uh, singing Psychedelic Shack. I was in 11th grade when that came out, 11th or 12th grade, and I can instantly be transported back to the high school I was at. I can see myself with kids. We're doing things, and all of a sudden, I'm not thinking about the, the how fast I'm driving. So I'm saying, what? That's not something I'm consciously thinking I'm going to drive too fast. It's just something when I start hearing, it just triggers something in me that uh, uh, my mind goes a different direction. So whether it's saying you're thirsty or you're hungry uh, or uh, you're going to relive uh, childish foolishness, probably it can happen. It's triggered externally. That's what we're talking about with the lust of the flesh. Uh, Paul gives a, a real good example of this in, in the Galatians chapter five. In verse 16, he says, walk controlled by the spirit. You will not carry out the strong desires of the flesh. Then he says in 17, the spirit wars against the flesh, the flesh against the spirit. They're in opposition to one another. And then he gives you a grocery list in 19 through 21. These are issues that can be triggered physiologically. He's got carousing. He's got sensuality, which would be pornography and such. He's got immorality. That would be physical sex of any kind. He's got drunkenness. You know, there's just the whole grocery list of things that we would associate with struggles with anger, outbursts of anger, uh, struggles with the flesh. So are there external solicitations that can trigger physiological responses? The answer is yes, there are. Lust of the eye. Uh, to the Greek, uh, when this was being written, it would be the concept of beauty. So it, again, it's got to be external solicitation because it's dealing from the piece of the pie that that is called, that we've called the world. So the world solicitation is always external. So that's external solicitation. 
but where the lust of the flesh triggers a physiological response, the lust of the eye uh, triggers, we would call it greed, we would call it envy. It's, it's someone's concept of something beautiful. Um, how, come, uh, how come your garden grows and mine dies? How come your flowers are beautiful and mine are scraggly? Uh, how come your computer is a gamer's computer and it just works great and mine hardly works at all? Uh, how come I drive a faith mobile, which uh, I put more money in trying to keep it running, and this ungodly person has the latest bends? And uh, I try to serve God and, and uh, I get stuck with a clunker of a car. Uh, in other words, it's something you've got, it's something I want, and it's something I will not be happy with or rest until I get what you've got. That's the notion of uh, the lust of the eye. Uh, how come uh, someone has Picasso paintings worth a fortune, and I have Carl Payne paint by number pictures that hang on my wall, which are worthless, other than the sentimental value? I wish I had what you have, and until I get what you've got, God, you're holding out on me. That's the concept of the lust of the eye. Agreed. Envy. The third aspect uh, uh, that uh, John uh, delineates is uh, the boastful pride of life. It's got to be what? External, because that's the, that's the enemy that we're dealing with. Uh, that context is what we're dealing with. But he makes a distinction between lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and boastful pride of life. So if someone just lumps them together, what are the struggles with the world? Well, I can, I can memorize the verse and say, oh, that's lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, boastful pride of life. If someone says, well, what's that? Well, I don't know. It's just the struggles with the world. Well, how do I recognize it? I don't know. Just read your Bible and memorize scripture. Is there anything wrong with reading Bible? No, that's great. Is there anything wrong with memorizing scripture? That's great. But if I don't learn how to recognize and respond to it, what, I might as well be reading Marvel comic books, uh, at least as far as trying to get help in dealing with a particular issue. In other words, the end game is not how many Bible verses do you memorize. The end game is can I apply the truth that God gives me through scripture so that I can actually stand instead of fall, particularly in light of opposition, which he tells me is there, so it shouldn't be a surprise. So what am I talking about when I say the boastful pride of life? I have used the word ambition out of control or selfish ambition. Nothing wrong with being ambitious. That's good. Uh, if you don't uh, take the time to plant a garden in the, you know, in the spring, you're never going to be harvesting a garden in the fall. So if you want to, if you want to go hungry, then don't work. Be lazy. Nothing wrong with being ambitious. <laughs> but what the John is talking about is ambition that's out of control, selfish ambition. That's the student that tells me they cheat because it's important to get good grades. Do I want to get good grades in school? Say yes. Yes, I do. It's better to get good grades and bad grades. But I also want to get my grades fairly and honestly. I don't want to look over someone's shoulder and copy their material. That is now an ambition, which nothing wrong with an ambition in itself, but it's selfish ambition because I'm not supposed to steal. And that's what I'm actually doing. I'm stealing your work and presenting it as my work. That's, that's not honoring God. That's ambition out of control. So if someone says, how do you explain uh, you know, the, the, the struggle with, with uh, <laughs> just blank. Lust the flesh, lust the eye, and boastful pride of life. It's, amb it's ambition that's out of control. Uh, I would like to have a brand new house. Okay, is there anything wrong with that? Nope, N not necessarily. But I'm going to have to go rob a bank to pay for the house. Well, that's ambition out of control. I'm stepping outside of God's will to accomplish some kind of goal that I've set for myself. If it's honorable, that's helpful. If it's not honorable, if it steps outside of the will of God, then that's no longer an honorable thing. So if someone says, first piece of the pie, a problem. Yeah, that's what the Bible says. Identified as what? The world. What is it? A system in rebellion against God. Where does the solicitation come from? It's always external. Uh, how do you... How do you recognize it? Well, it can come through three venues, three eye gates. Lust of the flesh, 
solicitation designed to trigger a physiological response, lust of the eye, something beautiful that you've got to have and you're not happy till you get it, or uh, ambition out of control, selfish ambition. It's, it's ambition on steroids, stepping outside of the will of God to get it. What's the resolution? That's Tigger, he's my buddy. Um, verse, verse 17, Carl, remember the things of this world fade away. The things of God abide forever. It's simple. I use one word, it starts with an E, evaluate. Evaluate the solicitation, whether it comes from the world as, as, a, as a, a physiological solicitation, whether it comes from the world as a love for beauty and an envious solicitation, or whether it comes from pride out of control type of solicitation. John says that I can successfully resolve that issue. I can respond to it in a biblical way by evaluating what's the solicitation? Am I giving away eternal treasure for temporary trash? It's too much. I'm giving away too much. Uh, I, I was speaking at a conference and a, and a woman asked me if I would tell the kids that drugs aren't fun. I was never a drugger in the sense of being loaded all day long, but I certainly over weekends use recreational drugs. And if someone would have said as a kid, if someone would have said, tell kids drugs can't be fun, I would say that's silly. Some drugs are fun. The issue isn't, is it fun? The issue is, is it going to give you what you think you're going to get going into it? And the answer is no, it doesn't. You don't get what you think you're going into it. Uh, you've still got the same issues to face when you, uh, if you're drinking and you drink to uh, take away pain, uh, once you sober up, you've still got the same issues to deal with. In other words, it's a temporary fix. John says, when you're evaluating the solicitations, you don't have to say that woman isn't beautiful. She may be really beautiful. You don't have to say that man isn't handsome. He may be really handsome. You don't have to say, that car is ugly. It may be a beautiful car. You don't have to say, I don't want uh, to get a good grade. I would like to get a good grade. What's it going to cost me? If it's something that I can do while I'm walking with God, it honors God, it's eternal treasure. That's something to say yes to. But if it's something that is temporary trash that is fading away, say no. So someone says, um, uh, look at look at this lady. You know, you're away. You're speaking. No one will ever know. You don't have to say she's ugly. You just say she's not worth my testimony. She's not worth my obedience to God. She's not worth my wife. She's not worth my marriage. She's not worth my character. It's not that it's not that she's not pretty, but I'm not giving away too much to get too little in return. I'm not giving away the satisfaction of being obedient to God and hearing well done for something that is going to fade away in time. Uh, my buddy Keith, he's a great ice skater, right? Plays hockey. He's, he's the guy that's helping make this work. I don't have to say that I would not like to be able to ice skate like he ice skates. I get on skates, I fall over. You just have to clear the road when I'm on ice skates and hope no kids get underneath me. I'll kill them. <laughs> Kaboom. You know, I don't have to saddle. Uh, nothing wrong with what, but if I have to go, uh, uh, you know, accost an ice skater and put a gun to their head and say, teach me how to ice skate or you're going to die. He would just go, there's nothing wrong with wanting to ice skate, but not when you step outside the will of God to accomplish that kind of thing. You're giving up too much for too little. You're giving away eternal treasure in obeying God for temporary trash that's going to fade. My knees are so shot now. I don't run. I don't jog. I don't ice skate. Doctor told me you can ride a stationary bike or you can swim. Riding a stationary bike for me is boring and I'm too lazy to go swim. It takes too much time. So, uh, well, you can walk, just don't to pound. Why? I got shot knees, man. So, I mean, there are some things that remind me, what if I had uh, stepped outside of God's will to do something because I thought it would be so much fun running, jumping, whatever. You get in your 60s, at least, you know, where I'm at, I don't do a lot of running and jumping now anyway. What did you give up? Too much for too little. Don't do it.
second piece of the pie, the flesh. Now, first, some people will say to me, aren't you duplicating an issue? This is real important. You catch this. Um, someone says, well, you already dealt with the lust of the flesh. I'll go, yes, we did. It's solicitation, physiological solicitation designed. It's designed to, to, to produce some kind of a physiological response, right? External solicitation designed to produce a physiological response. But it's in a context of what? World. We said solicitation from the world always comes from what direction? It's always external. On the second piece of the pie, the lust of the flesh, I give you two verses again. Why? Symmetry. I use Romans 7, 15 to 25, and I use Galatians 5, 17. Uh, Paul says four times in Romans 7 that there's an entity within him that's evil, driving him in a direction he doesn't want to go. The good that he wants to do, he doesn't always do. The things he doesn't want to do, he does. There's an evil entity within me, that is within my flesh, he says. It's sin within me. He uh, says the same thing, just shortens the concept in Galatians 5, 17, when he says, after verse 16, remember, walk controlled by the Spirit, you will not carry out the strong desires of the flesh. There's the promise. 17, the problem. Four, it's connected, conjunction. The spirit wars against the flesh, the flesh against the spirit. These are in opposition to one another that you may not do the things you choose to do. Galatians 5, written to believers or unbelievers? Say believers, because that's who it's written to. Contextually, it's talking to believers. Well, I thought once I became a Christian, everything crooked becomes straight, and I'm never tempted or solicited with anything evil. I go, you haven't been a Christian very long, if that's what you believe, or someone has lied to you in a, in a pitiful way. I became more aware of issues with the flesh after I became a Christian than I did before because there were so many things that I did that I just thought were normal and natural that after I became a Christian, I realized it doesn't please God. I don't mean that as a killjoy. I just mean as you mature and grow, there will be things that you start thinking about. Remember when Jesus says uh, to the religious leaders, you've been taught don't commit immorality. He said, I tell you, don't look on to a woman with lust with that in your heart. He, he, in other words, he kind of upped the ante. The more you grow, sometimes the more uh, you understand there's really more to this, whether it's walking with God or opposition to God, than I ever knew as a younger person. Uh, I think that's why uh, sometimes when you live in a culture that says if you're over 30, you're worthless, you know, live fast, die young, make a good looking corpse. Uh, it may be cliche, -ish, and we live in a culture that uh, thinks that way, but it's it's really uh, childish. I believe that's why countries that at least historically have honored gray hair, I think they get it right. They whether they're Christians or not, they get it more. It's it's more consistent with biblical truth than a a, a young culture that thinks it's all about uh, about. Uh, you know, the things that fade away and putting all your stock in that. It takes time to learn. It takes time to, to gather information. It takes time to learn how to apply that information. We would call that wisdom. Usually the one with the gray hair, if he or she has been smart enough to survive that long, they've learned something or they wouldn't have survived that long. And they have things that we can learn from. So again, I'll say the cultures that honor the people that are older, I think uh, uh, there's always exceptions. Of course, you can have old people that are just foolish. I can be 80 and think like an eight-year-old. Uh, but uh, all things being equal, we, we sometimes dishonor people that have an awful lot to share with us uh, in our exuberance and in our immaturity. But at any rate, what am I finding out? I'm reading that uh, with the second piece of the pie, yes, there are struggles with the flesh. I know... Uh, that they trigger physiological responses. Well, what's the difference with that and the lust of the flesh in the context of the, of the world? It's where it comes from. It's the direction of the solicitation. Uh, Paul says uh, in Romans 7, this struggle with the flesh comes from within me. He says it four times. In Galatians 5, 17, he says the same thing. The spirit wars against the flesh. The flesh against the spirit. They're in opposition to each other. There's a battle going on. I said earlier, how do you know whether you're caving into the flesh or not? Look at his grocery list in uh, 19 through 21, all kinds of issues that he says are associated with struggles with the flesh. Okay, 
I can recognize it. I can know that, okay, that anger, that was triggered by my flesh. Uh, there was a battle going on in my head. Do I blow up? Do I not blow up? Do I say it? Do I not say it? I can't stand that person. I'm going to go ahead and say it. I blow up. Now I've got so much collateral damage around me to clean up. I go, why did I do that? That wasn't worth it. That was not something triggered outside. There was something in the side that was bubbling in me until I finally thought, you know what? I can't contain the pressure. I'm going to blow up. And now I've got so many other people that have been drawn into it because of my foolish response. Um, when people say, I just had sex with her. I just had sex with him. No, you didn't. Don't insult me. No, don't be naive. Uh, people do not typically just walk up to each other at a, at a, at a, at a job station and say, uh, let's go have sex. Now you can watch some of those anatomy programs, some of those doctor programs, which if I was a doctor or a nurse, I'd be so angry with some of those programs on TV. The whole thing is about surgery and sex. That's what they should call the doctor program, surgery and sex. It doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. You don't walk down the hallway and grab some man or some woman and throw them in the closet and have sex in the closet. And then, you know, 30 minutes later, you're doing surgery in a hospital. That is not reality. Reality is there were a lot of little things that happened. There were conversations that shouldn't have happened. There's making excuses for contact with someone. There's changing uh, lunch hours so you can spend time with people. There's phone calls. There's texting. There's lots of little things that typically lead up to big things. What's, what's the point? The point is when I learn how to start recognizing things when they initially hit, instead of two years later after they become so ingrained, if I can start doing that, I can actually learn to, to win instead of lose. So I say evaluate the situation again. What's the resolution to struggles with the flesh? It's the same resolution as a struggle with the with uh, with the world in one sense, except the, but it's recognizing where it's coming from. It's it's internal solicitation this time. It's not external. How do I respond to it? I misspoke there a second ago. I'm sorry. When I'm dealing with the world, the resolution is the same thing. Evaluate it. Yes to the things of God. No to the things of time. When I'm dealing with the flesh, the external uh, uh, solicitation, but it's now internally triggered instead of externally triggered. Um, again, I don't mean this to be crude, but, but as a man, I can undress a woman in my mind. I don't have to have a billboard in front of me. In other words, I can lust over someone without being able to blame it on a radio or a billboard. I'm perfectly capable of that happening, uh, triggered from within. So we're talking about two different pieces of the pie. One of them triggered externally, that's the world. One of them triggered uh, internally, that's the second piece we call the, the flesh. The difference is here, and here's what's important. When I'm dealing with the external solicitation to the flesh, I'm told to evaluate. It's a good response. Yes to the things that are eternally relevant, no to the things that with time just fade away. But when I'm dealing with that second piece of the pie, I get different responses when the solicitation is, is internal. I get a 2 Timothy 2.22, flee youthful lust. In other words, there are some things that are so hot to just run from them. Uh, if that man, that woman is uh, soliciting you and you want to be honorable to God and honorable to your marriage vows and stuff, don't play with it. 2 Timothy 2.22 says flee the type, the type of lust that's associated with youth. In other words, it's just too hot. Instead of saying, sure, let's go talk, say, no, we're not going to talk. I'm, I'm not, I'm out of here. Uh, someone says, uh, I've struggled with alcohol and I'm finally free of being controlled by alcohol. Then don't go to bars. Well, my friends go there. I'll drink Coca-Cola. They'll drink. What happens once you're there? Well, I start thinking about the old days and thinking about things. Then I'll just say, well, I'll just have one drink. And then it's two and then it's three. Sometimes. Sometimes putting on your track shoes and running, fleeing, makes a whole lot of sense. So when I'm dealing with struggles that are internally triggered, designed to trigger a physiological response, that's the second piece of the pie. One response is just get, the, get out of the situation. Just leave. And when I walk into these shops that sell porn, 
uh, you know, I end up uh, feeling really guilty doing stupid stuff. Well, then don't go in the shop. Well, it's right on my way home. Well, then go a different way from home. Dude, drive home a different way. D don't go there. That's what Second Timothy 2.22 is saying. Use some common sense. There's a second response in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 to 24. Paul says, you put off the old man, the lust, the lust with the lust of flesh. You put off the old man, and you put on the new through the renewing of your mind. So a second response when you're wanting to win this with struggles from the lust of the flesh in the context of what? Second piece of the pie, where the solicitation comes from what direction? It's internal. One response can be it's too hot. I don't handle it well, just leave. It's a good response. Another one is I learn how to win in my mind. You put off the old, you put on the new through the renewing of your mind. See, I usually end up losing here before I lose out there. Once I start losing here, it's just a matter of time before I'm losing out there. So there's a principle. <laughs> the quicker you deal with stuff, and when you deal with things here, when it's a mental proposition, it's between you and God. No one else has to even be aware. Deal with it quickly. No collateral damage, no having to apologize to other people because you took care of it. Think of a Proverbs 23, 7. As a man thinks in his mind, so is he. And it's the same for the ladies. As a person thinks in their mind, so are they. What's it mean? The things I think long and hard on are the things I end up rationalizing in my mind. So I want to have right thinking. I want to think the way I should think. Instead of allowing my mind to drag me away different places and then say, oh, it just happened. No, it didn't just happen. There were incremental steps probably leading up. I started here. I ended up over here. And I'll say, Carl, I just took one giant step over here. What happened? I'll go, no. There were all kinds of steps in between, incremental steps. You could have shut this down anywhere, anywhere back here. But you let it go, you let it go, you let it go, you let it go. Now you're over here, and now you're scared, going, how'd that happen? It just happened. Don't, don't insult me. It's not true. Lots of steps. Catch stuff early. Then you don't have to clean up all the collateral damage because it didn't happen. I said it earlier. Win here, you'll win out there. Lose here, you'll lose out there. So learn to start winning in your brain. So I said, what's one response? One response is something's too hot. Run. What's another response? Start renewing your mind. Think on things the way God would have you think on them. If I told you don't think about a polar bear. Now let's go the other way around. Don't think about an elephant. Don't think about a pink elephant. What are you thinking about? Don't think about a pink elephant with red socks. What color socks that pink elephant got on now? Uh, don't think about a pink elephant with red socks and a green scarf on its nose. What's the scarf look like on his nose? Because I know you're thinking about a green scarf. See, I can say to someone, don't think lustful thoughts. Don't think angry thoughts. Don't think about how that person hurt your feelings. Don't think about how they unjustly accused you. What do you think about when you tell yourself, don't think about how they hurt your feelings? I immediately think how they hurt my feelings. It's very sincere to say, don't think about a pink elephant. That's sincere. I don't want to think about pink elephants. But if that's where I leave things, don't think about a pink elephant. I just reinforce what I don't want to think about, which has me thinking about elephants all the time, because I'm thinking, don't think about them, which in reality has me what? Thinking about them. So. How important is it in my mind as a person thinks his mind? Think about a polar bear. I want you to think about a polar bear. You got a polar bear? Can you see it? It's white. It's lifted up on, on, on two legs. It's got paws, great big things. Paws are black. And you can see these great big hooks, you know, on its... <laughs> it can, there's a reason those things can tear up a caribou or they can tear up a fish. Boy, they grab them and... and, and they're big and they're strong and they're powerful. It's got a black nose, you know, dark colored eyes, white fur. It's on an iceberg. It's fishing for a fish. It's 
dipping in trying to scoop up a fish. Can you see that big polar bear? Can you see its black nose? Can you see its paws? Can you see those big old nails on it? Yeah, I can see that. Are you still thinking about a pink elephant? No, I'm, I'm thinking about a polar bear. See, sometimes you train yourself to think about what you want to think about instead of just telling yourself what you shouldn't think about. It's sincere to say I shouldn't have thoughts associated with the flesh. But if you leave it as, I don't want to think about it, you in fact just reinforce the very thing you're trying to avoid. Start training yourself to think on the things that you want to think about. That is what Paul's talking about when he says, you put off the old and you put on the new through the renewing of your mind. You start thinking the way you should. So what am I saying? Help me again. Well, I'm dealing with the second piece of the pie, identify as the lust of the flesh. How's it different from the lust of the flesh with the first piece of the pie? First piece of the pie with the world, lust of the flesh is always triggered where? Externally. Second piece of the pie, it's triggered where? Internally. Issues can be the same, but it's where the solicitation's coming from. Response is different, though. When it's external, I say, I refuse to sell out cheap. I'm not giving up too much for too little. When it's internal, I say, sometimes this is so powerful, as this, I don't win at this, then leave. Change your friends. Change your direction. Go home a different way. Go to a different store. Uh, take a different lunch hour. Just be smart. Be smart. Don't be stupid. Sometimes it's not really that it's so hot. It's just that I've gotten sloppy in my thinking. Uh, instead of thinking about polar bears, I'm thinking about pink elephants. Well, then renew your mind. Start thinking about what you should think about. I'm a very angry person. And anger gets me in trouble. Yeah, you're right. That's what James 1 says. Be quick to hear. Be slow to speak. Why? Because the anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. I can say, I won't be angry. I won't be angry. I won't be angry. Or I can think of James 1, 19 and 20 and say, you know what? Something just triggered that, that could, could make me angry. But I've got two ears. Be quick to hear. I've got one mouth. Be slow to speak. I'm going to listen twice as much as I talk because when I start talking, it just gets me in trouble. It does not bring about the righteousness of God. So sometimes it's just saying, okay, the pink elephant, that's the anger. The polar bear is learning how to control my anger by controlling my thinking. When I don't shoot my mouth off, then I don't get myself in trouble. How do you do that? Well, I started thinking about James 1. Just had that rolling through my mind. My polar bear became James 1, 19 and 20. What do I know? Anger doesn't accomplish God's righteousness. Galatians 5 says it's an act of, it's one of, the, it's one of the, the results of being controlled by the flesh. I don't want that. So learn how to control wrong issues by thinking correctly about it. That's a second response. A third response. We already said in Galatians 5.16, when you learn to walk controlled by the Spirit, you will not carry out the strong desires of the flesh. So what am I suggesting? I'm suggesting that when I'm dealing with the first piece of the pie, I've got one essential response when it's external solicitation from the world, be it the less the flesh, less the air, the boastful pride of life. Evaluate the solicitation. Say yes to the things of God, yes to eternal treasure, no to temporary trash. It's a, it's an, I don't need more information. I just need to be obedient. It's a challenge. Are you going to be obedient or disobedient? Do what's right. When I'm dealing with second piece of the pie, still called the lust, the flesh, but this time the solicitation is internal, uh, says Romans 7, says Galatians 5. Uh, it doesn't say evaluate how long you can stare at pornography and still have wonderful thoughts about God. It doesn't say evaluate what he looks like compared to her, what she looks like compared to him. Don't spend hours looking at those magazines that have people with beautiful hair and perfect clothes and then compare. It doesn't say stare and evaluate. It says get away from that stuff. 2 Timothy 2.22, run. Don't look at trashy stuff. Why? Because the stuff you start thinking on, you end up rationalizing to do. Some things are too hot. I don't have to walk like this with my eyes closed. But on the other hand, I don't have to be purposely looking for trouble. Some things are wrong. Leave. 
Second time, no, it's not, it's so hot, it's just I'm careless. So I start thinking elephants and bears. Carl, renew your mind. Start thinking the way God would have you think. Instead of staying stuck on, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't do that, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't do that. Well, what should you do? How are you going to get after it? What are you going to do? Make a plan. And then thirdly, sometimes the response for victory with that Estrella again is, what does it mean to be controlled by the Spirit? Am I trying to live the Christian life on my own? Or am I realizing that I'm a temple of God, says 1 Corinthians 3.16. God lives in me, says uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. I've been sealed by the Holy Spirit, says Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Um, now there's, just some, there's just so many verses you know, that remind me. I belong, I'm, I, the Spirit of God lives in me. Well, I'm just, I just did it because it was a natural thing to do. That's a horrible, horrible excuse for someone that God lives in. I am no longer natural, I'm supernatural. So respond that way. Well, I can't do it on my own. You're right. That's why Galatians 5.16 says, when you walk controlled by the Spirit. Holy Spirit, I can't do this on my own, but I want you to fill me, control me, speak to me, speak through me. Now, what's big picture? What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that the response between the biblical response that I have to the world, evaluate, say yes to the things of God, no to the things of time, biblical response to struggles with the flesh, sometimes run, it's too hot, sometimes play games with the elephants and bears, renew your mind, and sometimes it's, uh, again, learning how to walk controlled by the Holy Spirit, letting him work through you instead of trying to fake the Christian life on your own. All three of those are different responses than evaluate. So when I walk out of Bible school or seminary and I'm told, listen, all you have to do is read your scripture and pray and you'll be fine. Folks, reading scripture is great, praying is great, but neither one of those are given to me in the Bible as an adequate response to struggles with the world or the flesh. Does that make sense? Keith, where am I on time? I didn't even, I didn't even look when I started. Put it right about there. Then let's do this. You're supposed to get a break. I was supposed to. Now let me just do the devil real fast. Give me five more minutes, and then uh, uh, we'll spend more time with this one anyway. When I look at the third piece of the pie, the devil, the supernatural, you can use a lot of verses. I typically use James chapter seven. Excuse me, James chapter four, seven to ten, and First uh, Peter, chapter five, six through nine. There are others. Uh, Ephesians chapter.